you know, he usually wasn't the most talented player on the floor anymore. So he became a lot more cautious and became a little bit more antagonistic. You know, the Pacers took him to seven games. You know, I, I think that was the toughest test for that team. Long time no see, Jay. So how are you? Like, uh, first and foremost, I want to know how's going under the quarantine life. I'm in the same place as usual. Um, you know, it's good to see people through various uh, Zoom and FaceTime. Mm -hmm. Things like that. First, a very general question to you. As a member of the interview cast in this documentary, do you enjoy watching it so far? The first four episodes, is that what you expected? Yeah, um, I got a chance to see the first eight episodes before they aired. And last year at the All-Star Game in Charlotte, I actually got to see like a kind of an extended teaser. They, they put mm -hmm. together like a preview episode that just demonstrated what the documentary was going to look like and you know they had already spoken to Michael Jordan one of their sit-down interviews and they had all that footage from the 97-98 season yeah, so they yeah. put together a single episode to just kind of show um, and give a feel for what it was going to be like but it wasn't really an authentic but just even that test episode I could tell this was going to be a great documentary. So I mean I feel like I saw many unseen footages from the documentary I mean, the time span has been nearly like 20 years. So why didn't ESPN unveil those exclusive footages like five years ago or 10 years ago? Why this year? The conditions in, under which Jordan and the Bulls granted that NBA Entertainment um, film crew access back in the 97-98 season was that they would not air the footage without the approval of Michael Jordan. Mm -hmm. uh, and I guess there are other people that had to sign off as well, but most notably, Michael Jordan had to be a part of any process. and so. It was really waiting for the right time and waiting for him to be comfortable and you know probably waiting for enough distance to pass between then um you know i think you've seen people a little more honest to speak out about what was going on back then particularly horace grant talking about the pistons <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> one notable quote that you wouldn't have had maybe 10 years ago or certainly not at the time but this distance has given a lot of people freedom to really speak their mind about what what was transpiring back then in the 90s. So I'm also very, very curious, when were you shot the interview and how's the entire process? Like how long was your interview? You can't recognize it. You pass by it every day. So I know it's in, in our newsroom, but I don't know when, like, I don't- When I, didn't even... when I shot it. Um, yeah. You know what, I don't remember now. Um, I, I, I don't remember this, but I, I just know they, you know, they send an email and say, hey, would you like to be in it? Um, you know, I said, I'd love to, to be in it. Um, it's just a matter of coordinating our schedules. Um, they were very accommodating. You know, for someone who ranks as low on the list of people that they talk to, you know, obviously Michael Jordan's at the top, Bill Jackson, Scotty, then you get all the way down to people like me. Um, you know, the way that they were willing to accommodate me and, and adjust to my schedule and come to the place that was most convenient for me, yeah. um, all those things that they did were really wonderful on their part, which they didn't have to. So, like, when was your first interaction with Michael Jordan? How how's that experience? Um, Ninety-one. So, uh, I was covering. Oh, actually, I wasn't covering. I, I was I was a senior at Northwestern, and I uh, um, I just went out to Bulls Media Day. Uh, they had their Media Day um, coming off their first championship, and it was kind of controversial because Michael had gone to the White House with the team, mm -hmm. uh, and so. It's just going to be interesting. It just wasn't going to be your typical media day, like, hey, you know, we're, we're great, we're ready to defend the championship. There was a lot going on. So I went out there and... and so from Michael Jordan's first title in 1991 to his last one in 1998, so as a beat reporter covered the Chicago Bulls, how do you feel MJ's openness and his relationship with media changed through uh, the last seven years? It started changing really, I'd say, the 93, when he started coming under attack more, and that's when you had the story about him going off to Atlantic City in the middle of the conference finals against the Knicks, and all these stories about gambling came out, and the Jordan Rules book came out, you know, so that comes out in 91, and it had taken a lot of stuff that was said in the locker room, and all of a sudden it's put out there, so he became a lot more wary, became a lot more aware that, you know, everything that he said was being recorded and could be distributed. So he became a lot more cautious and became a little bit more antagonistic. And all of a sudden he started addressing the media as you guys. Well, you guys say this, you guys say that. And that was a little different than it had been in the 80s and, and you know, the first year of the 90s. Um, everything changed. Um, you know, but there would still be these moments. I remember, I think it was 
before a finals game even. Um, you know, in 96, we're in Seattle, pretty small business locker room there. And he was still just, you know, hanging out a little bit and talking. He wasn't doing any formal interviews, but he was just chatting with like Terry Armour, who was the Bulls beat writer at the time for the Chicago Tribune. Um, so you could still have a little bit of that. And, you know, by like 98, I just feel like you just didn't even see him around that much, except for his mandated media interviews that he had to do. Yeah. So Michael won three peats twice in his career. Comparing to the first trip from 1991 to 93, what have changed after his 18 month vacation in terms of his leadership, uh, his wasn't character? Like he was playing baseball, he was, you know, but what you saw the different version that really stands out was, you know, you still had the more athletic Michael in the first three peat and the second three peat, you know, he usually wasn't the most talented player on the floor anymore. You know, throughout the eighties, in early 90s, he was usually the most ath athletically gifted person on the floor. That wasn't the case anymore. Virtually every team had at least one player that was more talented than him athletically at that point. Um, but what he had was by then the championship experience, which is invaluable, um, and just such a knowledge of the game. He just understood the, the geometry of the court and um, could recognize the double teams coming and could spin away from it. And, just knew where everyone was, where everyone was supposed to be, how the offense worked, all of that, um, so that he beat people with his brains much more than his body during the second three feet. So like in his second three, uh, three peats run, what was the toughest series do you think Michael have played? The Pacers theory or Utah Jazz theory? I think the Pacers, you know, the Pacers took him to seven games. Um, you know, I, I think that was the toughest test for that team. And they were just really running on fumes at that point. Not, not, not only were the Pacers a difficult opponent, but the Bulls were really worn down from, you know, three years ago into the finals, all the media scrutiny, you know, and then just, I mean, you see in the documentary, just daily questions about the future. Um, you know, you have to understand athletes are just intensely focused on the moment and that's, one of the things that makes them so successful is just their ability to just lock into what's transpiring on that day at that time what they have to do to get ready for that game and they were constantly being asked to project three four five six months down the road and to project about some things that were out of their control so that's very unsettling to an athlete professional ball player to to be taken out of your comfort zone to be disrupted from your rhythm and what you're trying to do mentally and to constantly have all these people you know, asking you to project and asking you to predict the future, which is impossible for them to do. A lot of it was beyond their control. So the mental grind of that season, um, you know, was really unmatched, you know, mm -hmm. at least in that era. I, I think the Warriors have experienced similar things in this day and age, with maybe even more media scrutiny. Uh, but it, it was a tremendous, tremendously mentally taxing season. So what was your favorite moment of MJ, both on court and off the court? I mean, there, there, there's, there's too many. There's, uh, it's, 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 it's almost like a montage in my head, you know, so I can't yeah. just like, pull one of them out and separate them. Um, you know, I, I was thinking though that the, the shot that he made um, was probably the most watched moment in basketball history. If you look at the ratings for game six and just the ratings for, for the 98 finals throughout, you know, more people watch that than anything. So, um, you know, it's not something that's unique or individual to me, but I just think the lasting memory of Michael Jordan is that, that shot and the extended follow through to, to win the finals in 98. So did he ever tell you what was his favorite moment or shot of in his career? Uh, not his favorite. Um, you know, I did ask him about the shot he made in 1982 to beat the, um, in the championship. He beats Georgetown 1982 NCAA championship. And I asked him just about what that meant to him. And, you know, he said he just gained so much confidence from it. And, and, and it really jump started his career and made him realize how many things were possible. You know, and I asked him, did you ever think about what would have happened if he didn't make that shot? And he just was adamant that no, he didn't want to think about it. And I don't, I don't even want to consider what could have happened back then, um, you know, if I hadn't made that shot. So, um, I know that, I don't know if that's the favorite, but I know that was an important pivotal moment. And I do recall the conversation we had about that. Mm -hmm. 
Another thing I noticed from the documentary is that I feel like Michael still is still tied to everything, and a lot of it seems still bother him today. For example, like his relationship with Isaiah Thomas and the Bad Boy Detroit Pistons. So why is he still tied to those things? That's who he is. He doesn't let things go. He doesn't forget. You know, manufacture a reason to be mad at somebody if that's what it takes.、Um, but you just see this.、Uh, You know these eternal grievances that he has are, are on full full display. You know he said, "I hated that team, the Pistons." You know, and the, the hate carries to this day. You know that was one of the more honest statements that he made made in the documentary.、Um, but that's just his personality. Like, yeah, just the, the the longevity of his memory. He was like an elephant, and and you saw it in his Hall of Fame speech when he's still mad at the high school coach that didn't put him on the varsity team. You know when he was in、mm-hmm, yeah. grade or whatever. You know, he still carries that grudge.、Uh, he had all those grudges that he that he aired.、Uh, still mad at Brian Russell, even though like all Brian did was try to play defense on him.、Um, you know, everyone that he carried a grudge against, like he aired it all out there in his Hall of Fame speech. So again, it, it shouldn't be revelatory if you if you profess to care about Michael Jordan and if you you know try to learn as much as you can about him and and try to absorb every word and every video clip, then. All of this has been out there before. 